Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isertel here for Renaissance Periodization, RP+, RPU, and our third lecture in Advanced Hypertrophy Concepts is on Overload Threshold Dynamics. Whoa, what is that? Well, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about uh, what the heck Overload Threshold Dynamics are. We're going to define overload, which is super important. We're going to talk about what the overload ranges are for tension, how much weight you're lifting, relative intensity, that's how close to failure you're going, volume and frequency of training. And then we're going to talk about the changing nature of overload because what used to be overloading yesterday may not be as overloading today and how we uh, sort of imply that into training, how chain, that training can change. Then of course, we're going to do programming recommendations just to get the meat and potatoes out of it and summary and implications. So what are overload threshold dynamics? Well, it's basically a series of explorations into the overload principle of training and what it implies. Because if we really deeply understand the overload principle of training, which is what we're going to try to do here today, it automatically implies a bunch of stuff for training and how you can program that might not be immediately obvious if you're not so sure what overload is, or if you're under an idea of overload that is not correct, right? Um, and of course, we have to explain what overload is. We have to define it and very deeply explain that definition so that we know that the overload definition is covering every aspect that we need. Once we do that, we can define what various overload thresholds are because there are various variables of training that make you grow. How heavy you're training, uh, how close to failure you're training, how much you're training in a given session, or how many sessions you do per week, all of these have to be hard enough to cause the best gains, thus the overload principle applies to them. So we're going to talk about how it applies to them once we understand what it really is. And of course, once we understand all that stuff, we can give pretty finite, pretty decent, at least beginning recommendations for programming. And these recommendations aren't like do X, Y, and Z. They're like, you know, if you do design programs, they should have these features probably. And if they don't have these features, they may be suffering from some kind of uh, inefficiency or lack of effect, right? Programming can have just like one box checked and three boxes unchecked and still work, but we're here to make sure it works as best as it can, right? So on that note, let's define overload. What does the overload principle mean? Uh, a lot of people think that overloading, and unfortunately it's kind of sort of uh, couched in its, the, the verbal uh, definition almost, if you just look at the dictionary, uh, overloading itself means overloading as is, uh, here's like loading and here's as overloading is over it. The people uh, are sort of can't blame people for thinking overloading must be more than you've ever done before or more than you're used to or something like that. So the term has a little bit of a problem, but it turns out it doesn't, uh, overloading training doesn't have to be harder than ever before. Okay. So if you squatted 135 for a set of 10 on Monday, on Wednesday, you don't actually have to squat at least 140. Uh, you can do 135 for another set of 10, just the same as you did on Monday, and it probably will still be overloading. So what does that mean? How can 135 again be overloading? Well, overloading really means that a stimulus has to be above the threshold of systemic function of that system that elicits robust adaptation. So in other words, if training is sufficiently challenging, not maximally challenging, then reliable adaptation actually occurs. Uh, this applies to every single system. So for example, if you are reading um, various literature to become a better appreciator of, let's say, Eastern literature, does every single successive book and article on Eastern literature that you read have to push your mind absolutely to a level it's never gone before, really struggling with ideas, in order for you to get better understanding of Western literature. No, as a matter of fact, you can get a better understanding of, of uh, sorry, Eastern literature if you read one book on it, and then you literally reread the same book. That's no, no, there's no novelty at all in that. There's no uh, accession of any previous limits, but you know, it was really challenging when you started reading it the first time. The second time, it's still challenging enough to make you better. Now, of course, as you can probably tell, if you start reading the book a third, fourth, fifth, sixth time, at some point, you're going to totally plateau on any kind of gains in understanding you're going to make because you basically get everything you can out of that book. But just like a book, 
just like a conversation with somebody, just like uh, training, just one exposure doesn't completely desensitize you to further benefits, right? So really, uh, tr you could say that training that's much easier than what is in your overload threshold is just not a reliable way to produce adaptations. Just the same way that if you are, you know, uh, already pretty close to an expert on Eastern literature and you read like a Wikipedia article about it, you might like skim the article and be like, there's nothing in here that made me any better at understanding Eastern literature because it's so far beneath my level of understanding. Not that it's wrong. And somebody who knows nothing about Eastern literature, for them, it is overloading. But for you, it is no longer, right? So uh, a better term for the overload threshold, right? And the overload threshold is literally we're saying, here's all the stimuli you can be exposed to from easiest to the most you can possibly do to yourself. The overload threshold is some point, right? here, which gives us an overload window or overload range above it and all the way goes, goes, goes up to maximal. And it's within here that things are sufficiently challenging to promote adaptations. So a better term for the overload threshold is reliable stimulus threshold. That is anything below here, can it make you better? Maybe, but it might not. So it's just not a reliable way to produce adaptations. So basically if someone can potentially lift the 20s, for sets of 10 challenging, uh, if you give them the fives and they just do sets of 10 with them, is it reliably going to cause any muscle growth? You just can't bet on it, right? So the overload threshold isn't like, oh, they have to. If they can do the 20s for sets of 10, they have to do the 20s for sets of 11 or the 21s for sets of 10. Not necessarily. It's the minimum amount of weight and or reps and or sets or whatever that is going to get some growth going. Right? That's the overload threshold. And we can debate later and we will about what the optimal is within there. But you know, maybe the 15s for sets of 10 aren't going to cause maximum adaptation, but they probably still do something. They might still cause some hypertrophy. So, you know, maybe better to call it a reliable stimulus threshold. It's a bit late for that. Everyone knows that it's the overload threshold. We'll keep the overload term, but remember, overload doesn't mean the most ever. It means in that range that is challenging to the system and elicits adaptations, which is to say reliably causes growth that is like somewhere in the range of optimal, right? If something causes like technically gains a gram of muscle over the course of a week, yeah, sure, it's, you could say it reliably causes growth, but it's not any growth you're going to write home about. So something that is, it, it, there aren't any uh, many alternative ways of training that are 50 times better than it or something like that. So... Here's the thing though, we say, okay, there's this overload range, right? And there's the overload threshold that's the border into that range or low threshold at the bottom, maximum ability to train at the top, right? But that begs the question of how challenging training has to be to a system's abilities in order to actually cause improvement. It does depend on the system. Now, um, it, it really, uh, for a variety of systems, it's been well studied. Here's an example that's not hypertrophy related, just to show you that we do actually know uh, some things very precisely in this. To reliably uh, train for power improvement um, in well-trained individuals, it's been shown that anything below 90% of peak power, like a clean and jerk or something, or a jump that's below 90% peak power, doesn't reliably improve a, a trained individual's power output. So the overload threshold for power for trained individuals is roughly 90% which is to say that if you always lift at 85% peak power and you're expecting to become more powerful, your expectations are probably going to be wrong, right? Is it 90% for everything? No, absolutely not. Sometimes it's a higher percentage. Sometimes it's a lower percentage, but there is a percentage. Generally speaking, it's close to a system's limits, right? So <clears throat> this is a really good news because it offers us um, kind of a very simple analysis uh, to, for lack of a better word, shit test whether or not we think we're training hard. Now, all the science aside, we'll give you a bunch of numbers and recommendations. But I'll tell you this, um, at the very core of the overload principle, at the very core of the idea of where the overload threshold has to be is, is generally it's close to a system's limits, which means that you can take this insight into training and, and, and do the following. If in any one of the categories we're going to be analyzing today, how heavy a weight is, how close to failure you are, how much you're doing in a session and how many sessions you're doing per week. If you're very far away from your ability to execute, then it's not likely that you're going to be giving the best adaptations or really any adaptations at all. Which is to say that if someone describes a training as like ridiculously easy, super infrequent, teeny tiny bits of volume, and then says, hey, this is the best way to grow, you got to be super skeptical. And if you look back on your own training, you're like, man, I've been really taking it easy in the gym. 
and you're expecting this training to cause growth, it's probably not the case. Now, does this mean that you have to look back on your training and be like, I've literally been trying to kill myself in the gym as often as possible, as hard as possible, as much volume as possible? Is it the only way to get growth? Almost certainly not for almost all people. But most individuals, especially intermediates and above, training's got to be hard. Okay? If training isn't challenging, if it doesn't feel like a challenge, if you're not done with a session or done with a week of training or even done with a set, a working set, and you're not like, oh, whew, that was something, right? If that's not the case, eh, you're probably not getting better, right? You're probably not adding muscle, right? But we can do better than that. So we can give more specific uh, recommendations by looking at four specific, very important training variables, figuring out where their overload thresholds probably are. We're going to start with tension, just to say loading, how much weight is on the bar, so to speak. Relative intensity, which is how close to failure are you taking any specific set. Volume, which is to say how many sets, working sets you're doing per action, per workout, uh, and per session, we call it. And then lastly, frequency, how frequent your uh, training sessions are throughout the week, how many of them you're doing, basically, per muscle group. Once we combine all those, if we know what the overall thresholds are for those, then we got a pretty good insight on how hard training needs to be to reliably cause adaptation. Really, really, really important. If at the end of this program, or sorry, at the end of this television program, at the end of this lecture, you'll be able to really literally have a checklist that you can apply to your own training and ask yourself, is my training likely overloading, All right? Is, am I meeting, am I above the overload threshold of at least most of my training? And if the answer is yes, you're good to go, right? Uh, and we'll talk about more specifics of a, a sort of a search for more optimal within that threshold a little bit later in this lecture as well. So without further ado, the tension overload range. Direct research, especially over the last several years, has found a couple of cool things. First thing, number one here, working sets, <clears throat> even when taken close to failure, which we'll talk about in the next uh, slide is, uh, or in the next topic is uh, very, very important. Even hard working sets, lighter, much lighter than th right around 30% of one rep max are not reliably or optimally hypertrophic, which is to say that if you do uh, some working sets of 20% of your one rep max, uh, you may cause muscle growth that's detectable, or if you're sufficiently advanced, especially, because beginners kind of grow from everything, um, you might not cause any muscle growth that's detectable. Um, and if you do, uh, let's say we repeat this experiment of you trying 20% of your NRM for working sets, even if it causes reliable hypertrophy, which could, could very well cause, it's very unlikely to cause optimal hypertrophy. So for example, one study actually directly compared sets at 20 repetition max to sets at 40 repetition max. And it showed that the 40 repetition max sets at something like double the hypertrophy of the 20. I mean, gee, you know, like that's a real serious insight. Note, 60% of 1RM had basically no difference than 40, right? So it's not just like, oh, it was double, right? It's not just that. There's something inherently about a weight being probably too light, maybe not stimulating a muscle's ability to detect tension nearly enough for it to say, okay, well, there's enough tension. There's a reason for hypertrophy. Hit it, boys, and speak into its own intracellular mechanisms, right? At some point, the weight may just be too light, and that point may be something significantly below 30% one rep max, right? We'll see in the in a graph we're going to display in the next slide that it's definitely a sliding scale. It's not like, you know, 29% you have zero growth, and at 30% you have exactly the same growth as you would anywhere else. It's a sliding scale, but that slide is notable right around that 30% mark. On the other hand, they've tested loads all the way up to 100 <clears throat> plus percent of 1RM, which is you can do overload eccentric, so like 110% of your uh, one rep max, you can slowly lower in a, a Smith machine bench press, for example, then research uh, the research team slides some of the weights off and you press back up some fraction of it. Uh, working sets as heavy as 100% plus 1RM have been shown to be reliably hypertrophic. Okay, sweet. So we get reliable hypertrophy anywhere between 30% and 100% of 1RM. Okay, cool, cool. Looks like we sort of have an overload threshold there. <coughs> and notice <clears throat> when I said that sometimes uh, the overload threshold is really close to a system's limit abilities. Sometimes it's not super close. This is an example where it's not super close. You would think like, okay, how am I going to grow muscle? It's got to be at least 90% of one rep max. Uh, that's actually not true. 30%. Very few people speculated even five years ago that 30% was light enough to cause hypertrophy or sorry, heavy enough to cause hypertrophy. But it turns out that is in fact very likely the case. So a couple of problems with that right? 100 plus percent 1RM are, is fine. It, it causes reliable muscle growth, but unfortunately, anything much over 85% plus 1RM, though it does cause 
basically as much growth as any other rep or as any other uh, intensity range, any other loading range, tension range, uh, as low as 30% one of them. It's got the very, very added problem of per repetition and per set, the amount of fatigue generated by training like that is massive and is very disproportionate. So can you hypothetically accumulate enough volume, do enough sets and reps at 95% 1RM to equal the hypertrophy you would get at 70% 1RM? You could, but you could not do that reliably because after several training sessions, you would start to accumulate so much fatigue, you won't be able to perform anymore. You start to get weaker. You start to get likely injured and your hypertrophic stimulus actually declines at a biochemical level. So at least in the medium term, because <clears throat> there could be some nuances here with periodization, working sets in the 30% to 85% 1RM range, right? Anything above 85 is just not sustainable, but between 30 and 85, <clears throat> they're absolutely going to provide overload stimulus very likely. Okay, there, that's the overload threshold more or less. So at least in the medium term, 30% of 1RM to 85% 1RM looks like our overload threshold, at least in the several months of training, anywhere between there actually seems to cause roughly an equivalent amount of hypertrophy, roughly an equivalent. It's a very, very likely future research will show that some parts of that range are more optimal for some people under some conditions, so on and so forth. We can fairly sure that if we walk into a gym and we see someone lifting with 35% of 1RM max and they're doing hard sets close to failure, we can't automatically be like, bro, that's too light right? Uh, no, it could very well be causing reliable hypertrophy and probably is, right? Because most of us don't do one rep maxes on like cable upright rows. How the hell are we supposed to know what 30% of that is? Most bodybuilding or hypertrophy training is not on the compound, you know, lifts that we normally max out on. That is the squat bench and deadlift. I mean, I don't even know how to max out on a pull-up. That would be like sort of, I don't know. I don't know if my shoulders would be huge fans of that sort of thing. So how do we gauge this? Well, luckily for most people, it's a very, very broad average, sets of five repetitions on a first set to 30 repetitions on a first set, basically very close to failure, roughly correspond to that 30% 1RM to 85% 1RM range. So if a weight is so heavy for you that you can only get it four times on a first set, gee, you know, it's probably too heavy and it's probably in excess of 85% of 1RM and it's going to be too fatiguing in the long term or even in the medium term over several weeks for it to be a good idea to lift for hypertrophy. On the other hand, if you can do like 40 or 50 reps on a first set, it might be too light of a weight. It might be south of that 30% 1RM and then all of a sudden it's not a good idea. So because you're not going to try to max out everything all the time, that 5 to 30 is really, really good. It comes in really, really handy. So if you know, try and lat pull downs and you want to do uh, a hypertrophic set and you start to move the bar and you can clearly tell this is going to be like a 50 rep set, just stop, count it as a warm up, put more weight on the bar until you know it's going to be between five and 30 reps. The very simplest way you're going to at least get some muscle growth out of that. So if we graph this relationship, which is really important to visualize it. So we're on slide number seven here and we have on the Y axis, how much growth we have per set, growth stimulus per set, how much growth machinery is being activated. And on the x-axis, we have percent of 1RM as far as how much tension is applied. We'll start on the left side at the very beginning of the graph, the end of the green line here at that 0%, which clearly 0% of tension elicits zero hypertrophy, okay? So you're not lifting anything. Like, you just you in the space shuttle doing this, okay? And what do astronauts that go to space in the space shuttle and do this with various tools, with no resistance, come back, they come back losing 10, 15, 20 pounds of muscle. So definitely not hypertrophic. But <clears throat> as we slide up to 20%, you'll notice that, and this is a bit of a hypothetical graph, but there's probably some hypertrophy that occurs. Maybe it's only enough hypertrophy to like grow your legs as much as they need to walk. But then you think about it, like when you walk up and down the stairs, uh, that's probably sort of like 20% of your max legs ability to push, which includes your body segment weight above your knees. And it's going to cause some hypertrophy. It absolutely will. There's nowhere close to optimal. Then we see this big inflection point here where this inflection line, basically between 20 and 40% or 20 and 35% of 1RM, where anything much above 30% is roughly equivalent. Now, I try to make this a little bit more of a speculative graph to what I think is probably the correct, um, the very depth of the true answer, which is I think that Hypertrophy yield by very small margins probably increases up to about 70% 1RM. 
uh, but then probably flat lines after that. But super moot point, you can just see this last part of the segment, anything from 35% all the way to 100 and above is probably a roughly straight line, and any difference there is going to be very small. All right, so we know that we have to train a certain degree of heavy, but in that entire conversation, we talked about, okay, Working sets. Working sets have to be between 30 and whatever, because clearly warm-up sets don't have to be anything. They're just warm-up sets. They don't count for growth. Working sets are sets that are done with the intended purpose of eliciting hypertrophy, not preparing to elicit hypertrophy, but actually stimulating it. Well, <clears throat> these are called working sets. They're also called hard sets. Why are they called hard sets? Well, if you stop way short of muscular failure, it's been demonstrated pretty reliably that you're not guaranteed reliable growth uh, or certainly anywhere close to optimal growth. Even if you do a large number of sets, you might be so working so inefficiently that it'll take you like, you know, 40 sets per workout to get the same hypertrophy you could get out of like six or seven sets if they were appropriately close to failure. So being close to failure is important, right? This is concentric failure. So we can say it's true that working sets must be sufficiently close to concentric failure to produce the best adaptations. And it's probably due in some large factor to motor unit recruitment on average, larger more powerful, faster twitch, more growth pro motor units don't activate until they're needed to produce the higher and higher forces uh, within each. So the force in every repetition for every rep is roughly the same as you start from, you know, your first rep to let's say 15 reps to failure. The, the average force is the same as long as the velocity is roughly the same. And you can absolutely arrange for the average force to be the same. And it can be a little bit different. What happens is, a bunch of your muscle fibers, especially the ones that have been on for a while, the slower twitch ones, you start to tire out. The rest of your muscle tires out. Everything else about maybe the uh, the central nervous system, etc., starts to tire out. And thus, in order to keep producing enough force to do another repetition, and another repetition, and another repetition, your body has to turn on more of these faster twitch motor units, which are usually just dormant. They don't sit around and do a whole lot of not much. Now, they might actually turn on quite early in this process, way before like five reps from failure, but they're not turned nearly maximal enough to stimulate a ton of tension through them, stimulate a ton of metabolite production inside them, and thus reliably cause best hypertrophy. So these very fastest twitch motor units, which are responsible for a lot of the growth, not all of it, a lot of the growth probably turn on much more and are stimulated much more the closer to failure you get, especially in the last five repetitions, right? So anything further than five reps out from failure just doesn't really produce reliable growth in the normal volume ranges that we're used to training in. We'll get to those next, but can you stay <clears throat> 10 reps short of failure and still get really good hypertrophy? Yeah, you probably can. You might just have to do triple or quadruple the number of working sets, which is to say you're wasting your time like, in a huge, huge way, right? Training, what, what about past failure? Do we get hypertrophy benefits training past failure? What the hell's past, how the hell are you supposed to train past failure? Well, it's, it's actually quite easy. You're doing a machine bench press and you fail at 100 pounds, 15 reps exactly. You put the weight down, you really quickly change to 50 pounds and you keep going. The set extends past failure with some kind of load reduction. A training partner could do this for you in the bench press. They help drag it up a little bit for you. Training past failure is very likely highly effective, it causes lots of growth, but unfortunately, it probably causes linearly more growth, but exponentially more fatigue. So at some point past failure, probably right after the first rep past failure, the amount of fatigue generated relative to the amount of muscle growth stimulus that occurs is so vastly different, it's so much, that you're better off never really going past failure outside of special cases, stopping as soon as you hit failure or even a couple reps shy of it, resting for a while and just doing another working set. Just doing another working set still produces really good more growth stimulus, it adds to that total growth stimulus for that session, but it doesn't produce this crazy, crazy, crazy amount of fatigue, right? Imagine that someone told you that in order to become the best endurance runner, you have to run until your legs physically can't move every single training session. Yeah, okay, sure. How far would you get if you ran at a pretty fast pace until your legs couldn't move? You can't get up and keep running. I mean, you're basically done and you're probably done for a long time. Several days, you're gonna get crazy soreness. You're gonna accumulate so much fatigue, you won't reliably be able to run enough kilometers or miles per week to become the best endurance athlete. Endurance athletes figured out this out maybe hundreds of years ago. 
most endurance training doesn't push this, the, the human being to absolute limit. It pushes them close. But most endurance athletes know, but to push yourself all the way to the limit, the amount of fatigue is, is non-linearly related. It's exponentially goes up, right? So same idea in hypertrophy training, going all the way past failure probably isn't the best idea. There's a great way to grow. It's just not sustainable from a fatigue perspective. So if we graph the relative intensity into the overload range, on the x-axis, we have how many reps in reserve you have. Zero reps in reserve means you're trained to failure. Two reps in reserve, RIR, means you had two reps in the tank when you stopped, right? You're like benching, you're like, oh, we got about two, this is getting tough, and rack, right? And then, of course, we go all the way to 10 reps in reserve, which means you stop a set 10 reps away from failure. Now, notice, Hypertrophy stimulus per set, by the way, is on the x-axis just for reference. So what we're looking at is how much muscle growth can we signal to occur per set based on how close to failure we get. Notice, super important, we start all the way to the left side, bottom of the graph at 10 reps in reserve. The hypertrophy stimulus per set is not at zero, okay? For very advanced individuals in very uh, certain circumstances, it could be very close to zero or really at zero, right? I think as you get more advanced, you may have to push things a little bit closer to failure. There's very, very, uh, in the scientific community of hypertrophy uh, you know, research, we're very, very open-minded to that idea. It, it, possibly not true, but it's possibly true. However, for many people, much of the time, you don't actually have to go all the way to failure to get some growth. But notice the amount of growth, if we sort of scale it here, maybe like one-fifth the amount per set that you could be getting if you went closer in failure. So can you imagine someone stopping 10 reps shy of failure and doing five sets where they could have just done one set close to failure and gotten the same amount of growth? I mean, good God, like what a giant waste of time that kind of training is. As a matter of fact, you might experience so much fatigue from doing those many sets, the stimulus to fatigue ratio might be off. Okay? You're basically like endurance training for your growth. Not the best way to do things. So 10 reps shy of failure, provided that the load is above 30% 1RM, causes you some growth, but very little growth. There's probably a roughly linear rise all the way until we reach about five reps in reserve. And then, because this is an S-curve shape, there's probably around five reps in reserve, kind of a, a sort of a knee, a bend in the curve that radically escalates the growth fraction that we get by going closer and closer to failure. Why five RIR? Because that's probably when we reach close enough to failure for a high enough percentage of these faster twitch, larger, more growth per motor units to start to really have to turn on more, push themselves to the limit, and thus elicit growth inside their own cellular structures. Anything much less than five reps in reserve probably doesn't do that to such a significant extent. So if we really try to overload, try to put an overload threshold number on this, yes, you can get <coughs> reliable growth with less than five RIR training, but it's nowhere near optimal growth. So the overload threshold really is about five reps in reserve. And then after that, going from five reps in reserve to four reps in reserve grows much more muscle, which is to say um, the following happens. If you're used to training and you stop all of your sets at five reps in reserve, the only thing you change next month after a deload is you push all sets to four reps in reserve, you're going to grow a lot more, like significantly more. On the other hand, going from four reps in reserve to three reps in reserve also causes a significant boost in gains but not as much of a boost in gains very likely as going from five to four. Same pattern from three to two. Yeah, it's better to go two RR than three RR in your average training session, but the gains are modest and different. So if someone's training three reps in reserve all the time, you come up to them like, dude, you're really wasting your time. You should do two reps in reserve training. Here, try this program. Let me know how it feels two or three months later. They're gonna say, yeah, I think I grew a little bit more muscle. It's not a crazy amount, and they're gonna be correct. Going from two to one RIR is probably a very small boost. One to zero RIR is such a small boost we haven't been able to detect it in the literature. So direct studies comparing one or two reps shy of failure and actual failure can't really reliably come up with any difference in hypertrophy, but theoretically there's probably good enough theory that all the way to failure is probably better in one session. And of course, you get probably that same tiny little boost going a little bit beyond failure. However, Remember that this is just for hypertrophy stimulus per set. It's not for fatigue stimulus per set, which very close to after two RIR starts to go up probably in an exponential looking curve. So as you go from five RIR to two RIR, stimulus and fatigue go up roughly linearly. And in fact, uh, stimulus might go up even higher at that point, making two RIR a pretty sweet spot average target for reps and reserve. But after you go to two RIR, you start to have more and more fatigue, probably rising faster than the stimulus, 
which is to say that anytime you train between two and zero reps in reserve and certainly above, you're a little bit sort of on the clock. Uh, you're, you can only sort of get that optimal output for, man, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe just one week if you're talking about training to failure or beyond failure. That anything after that is going to be very, very suboptimal because fatigue will have accumulated way too much. But for now, we know anything between five and zero reps in reserve, probably a pretty good representation of the relative intensity overload range. Very cool. Next up, the volume overload range. Okay, we know how heavy we have to train, roughly between 30 and 85% one RM. We know it should probably be on average pretty close to failure. You know, like you don't want to do a set of 20 with your 30 RM, maybe set of 25 or above is good, right? But that's just talking about one set. How many sets do we have to do in a session to be overloading, right? Because, you know, doing one set Beginners will grow from it, and we'll cover that in just a little bit, but advanced individuals, gee, you know, just one set per session might not cause a reliable amount of hypertrophy or certainly not an optimal hypertrophy. For example, if you do even seven sessions per week, if you're a very advanced individual, seven total sets, that is if you do one set per session, seven total sets per week may literally not be enough to cause your best growth. Uh, or to cause much of any growth. It might just be right around your maintenance volume at that point. So we actually have to ask the question of, you know, how many sets per session gets us, first of all, reliable growth, so minimally effective volume. And then later we have to ask the question of what's the most number of sets per session we can survive, right? And somewhere between there will be the optimal amount, the maximum adaptive volume that is on average, the, uh, the amount of sets you do per session that cause the best results. So in technical terms, what we're talking about is the distance between the MEV and the MRV. If you're familiar with our uh, volume landmarks literature, there's a whole books on volume landmarks that Dr. James Hoffman and I wrote called How Much Should I Train? Um, give that a look if you're super curious. In beginners, minimum effective volumes, the fewest number of sets you have to do reliably per session to grow, can be as low as one set. Absolutely, per muscle group, right? So just one set of chest press and your chest grows uh, very, very reliably. Um, however, uh, the maximum recoverable volumes, how much, what's the most someone can do, uh, they start out pretty low, but they quickly rise to around five to 10 sets per session, right? Pretty well documented there. And how about intermediates though? Intermediates, they're not as lucky as beginners, right? For them, minimum effective volumes are usually between two and four sets per session, right? And maximum recovery volumes are higher because they're much more used to training are somewhere between 10 and 15 sets per session. Very curiously and very importantly, maximum adaptive volumes, which are usually expressed as an average over a mesocycle because they do shift and change, have been found, at least by several individuals and in analyzing the data, including James Krieger, who's highly recommended, something like around eight sets per session, perhaps, right? Um, that's based on a ton of factors, though. At any one point in time, at any one mesocycle, for any one individual, any one muscle group, the maximum adaptive volume can be somewhere between three and roughly 12 sets per session in many lifters and many times. So give that some thought. It's a floating number, but okay, let's take something out of this. Let's graph it and see what kind of representation we get. X axis, number of working sets per session. Y axis, hypertrophy stimulus per session. And this is just an example numbers for medium intermediate lifter because everyone has their own volume landmarks. We can see here though that how much hypertrophy do we get with zero sets per session? Well, zero. How much do we get with one set per session? Like a very, very tiny amount. Two sets per session, we start to see an inflection point go up. And then we get to four sets per session, we're doing a lot of hypertrophy. Six sets per session is close to optimal, right? As an average weekly set number. It seems that when this example or this graph, um, you know, eight sets, around eight sets per session is somewhere at the top of the curve. And then as you get to nine and then 10 and then more sets per session in this example, and the numbers don't have to be 10 sets, whatever they are, 12 or 15, everyone has a point beyond which doing more sets literally just causes more damage which takes resources away from muscle growth and causes less and less growth. So it's very possible if you stop a workout at 10 sets, you get your best muscle growth. 
if you stopped it at 15, like you literally just did, you're like, oh yeah, hardcore, let's do another five sets. Like every single one of those sets is costing you muscle growth signaling because it's imposing such a heavy toll on your ability to grow, right? And by the way, this is not a surprising relationship that there can be a U-shaped curve, uh, which, at which point there's too much of a good thing. Okay, this is a, almost exactly the same curve with number of drinks you can have at a party to have fun. Right? So alcohol is not a pure fun molecule. Some would like, like to believe that's the case. It's actually a really similar curve. So let's look at it, this is an alcohol analogy. Zero drinks, how much alcohol-induced fun are you having on the y-axis? Ah, uh, you know, zero drinks, zero alcohol-induced fun. You can have all kinds of different kind of fun. What about two drinks? Like, we'll say per session, that's per evening, right? In a in a party. At a, you're at a party for five hours, how many drinks, right? Two drinks, yeah, you know, nothing to write home about. You may not even feel two drinks. You feel a little bit more loose. At four drinks, you're having some fun. Things are going super well. You're feeling yourself. At six drinks, you're having a, a time. And somewhere in this example, between seven and nine drinks, you're just the life of the party, but as any of us who have gone to college and successfully survived that process know, north of nine drinks, 10 drinks, 11 drinks, you're probably having less fun now. You're throwing up, you're rambling at people and getting into fights, you get lost on the way to Chipotle and wake up, you know, three in the morning with vomit all over yourself. Oh, such fun with alcohol. Turns out there may be an optimal per session range of alcoholic drinks to have that are super fun. And it's totally different on the person, totally different on the evening, et cetera, et cetera. But there is that range. Same idea for muscle growth. Only so many sets you can do, they're going to be beneficial. After a while, there's such a thing as too much of a good thing, probably because of excessive damage. Okay. So that's per session. Oh, somewhere between three and 10 sets is best for growth, depending on circumstances. Again, sort of an analogously large range to our uh, tension range, right? 30 to 100% 1RM. It's very, very, very similar. So what about the frequency overload range? One session is overloading. Okay? If we have an overloading session, does that mean we have long-term muscle growth? No, because can you imagine someone says, hey, how much have your legs grown in the last six months? And you're like, surprisingly, they didn't grow at all. And they're like, well, why not? I thought you were training. Like, yep, I trained. Like, okay, um, okay, so what was your training like? Well, I did squats, I did leg presses, I did leg extensions, I did eight total sets right in range of the maximum adaptive volume from the literature. I'm like, wow, wow. That's not, that's really trippy. Um, were your nutrition good, sleep good? They're like, yeah, it was great. Blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, was, what a mystery. Like, um, maybe you were overtrained. How many like sessions did you per week? And they're like, what am I? Guy? I mean, I trained once during that six months. What would your reaction be if someone said that? You're like, well, hold on a second. You gotta train more than once. And this person said, I didn't know that there was, let's say it's a robot or an AI just trying to learn to be human. They're like, I didn't know there was an overload threshold for frequency. Well, there is, right? It turns out you got to train more than once. And that's an understatement. Uh, it turns out that if we look at something like a week's length of time, we can start to come to an understanding of how many times, you know, is overloading at all or not. And then how many times gets us closer to optimal, right? So we know multiple sessions have to be done in sequence. The question is how many? right? Um, another way to ask this is how often should the system be disrupted in order to cause cumulative gains to occur? Because you disrupt a system, it causes muscle gains to occur, and then they sort of deteriorate. And then you probably have to stimulate somewhere around this area, and then more muscle gains occur. And then of course, that adds up over time. But if you let the muscle gains recede completely before hitting it again, you're just going to be training for basically nothing, right? So the answer to this of how many sessions can we do or do we need to do how often is at least often enough for the MPS area under the curve, muscle protein synthesis area under the curve to be positive, net positive. And it says, see frequency graph one. So we're going to go to next slide, frequency graph one. What are we looking at? If you train, so on the X axis is number of days, goes up to 10 plus. On the y-axis, it says muscle protein synthesis, MPS, right? So if you look at here, we have the training session at the origin, and muscle protein synthesis peaks, it looks like in this example, right around two days and falls off to normal right around four days. So once we get to around four days, then muscle protein synthesis actually goes back to normal. And then, because the human body normally catabolizes muscle at some, some rate, and if there's no reason to grow any muscle, it stops doing that, your body starts reverting to homeostasis in a very slow manner and starts to burn a little bit of muscle, a little bit of muscle, a little bit of muscle over the next several days. 
at about 10 days ish, and this is actually pretty reliable for most people at most times, right around a week and a half, you're probably back to about the same amount of muscle you started if you only trained once 10 days ago. So you've sort of burned through all of your gains, which is to say two things. If you train at least one more time within that 10 days, right, you trained at day zero, healed at tra- or completely, went back to homeostasis at day four, right? And then if you train at least once after that, you're going to probably get net muscle growth. Okay? If, if that session is above minimum effective volume, at least somewhat overloading, um, reliable. Uh, but if you train after the 10 days, let's say you train at day 10 and then again at, you know, day 20 and so on and so forth, there's a good chance you're going to cause about zero net growth okay? on average. There's definitely exceptions, but on average. So if someone said, Hey, if I only train once every 12 days, am I guaranteed to grow muscle? I'd be like, yeah, you know, if I was talking to an intermediate, that eh, probably not, you know, and if someone was like, Hey, I'm training, I can only train the same muscle group once every six days. Is that, uh, Good enough. I'd be like, yeah, that's almost certainly going to cause robust, reliable muscle growth in most people, right? All right. So what about the top end, right? Because this is at least often enough. The overload range begins at uh, enough uh, for uh, the muscle protein synthesis to have a positive area under the curve, which is sort of say about training once every 10 days. What about the top end, right? The top end is however many MPS curves, that is from training sessions, you can fit in to say a week without fatigue preventing the curves uh, from being generated at all. So for example, if we look at frequency graph number two, what you can do is train at day zero. Let's say you recover right around day three, train again at day three, there's another bump. Your, your muscle growth goes back to baseline, well, sorry, back to zero at day six again, and you train again, and then at day nine, so on and so forth. Now, do these curves have to be three days long? Absolutely not. If you train a little bit less, they're shorter. So there's a way in which many people can hit their minimum effective volume by training so in such a way that they heal one or two days later, which means that many times you can train muscles pretty close to optimally up to six and maybe even more times per week. But You can also do more training per session all the way up to, well, gee, you know, like eight to 10 sets, still get very, very awesome gains. It might take you three to four days to recover. And then you're looking at only twice weekly training, but still there's none of that red area, right? There's no time where you're really losing muscle. You're gaining muscle, going back to normal and re-stimulating. Is it possible to re-stimulate muscle growth while you're still growing it? Thus, summating more and more and more muscle, it is possible in the short term through functional overreaching, but unfortunately, muscles probably have refractory periods for growth. When a muscle is in the process of recovering from another training session growing muscle, further stimulus probably causes much less additive growth. So it might not be worth it. It might be worth it just sort of wait. It's almost like um, if you're trying to gain weight uh, one hour after you've eaten a really big meal, trying to eat more. You might eat almost nothing and, and just delay how uh, how long you're hungry again for another several hours. It might be worth it to just wait three whole hours and then eat another good hearty meal. That may be the way you get to eating as much as possible. Um, also, fatigue dynamics. If you're going to overload so often that you don't even let the muscles recover during that time, at some point, fatigue is going to rise so high, you're not going to sustain that training frequency for very long, right? Which takes us to the last frequency graph that we're looking at. And the take home message here is the following. So let's look at this graph, number of sessions per week on the X axis and hypertrophy stimulus per week. We look at one session per week, and this has been very well documented in the literature, going from one session to two sessions in a week is going to grow much more muscle, significantly more muscle. Uh, and this is just an example for, for an average muscle group. It's different for muscle groups and individuals. But in almost every case that's been studied, training twice a week is better than training once a week. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, that MEV to MRV hit that you're going to give to your muscles, that close to maximum adaptive volume, 3 to 12 sets per session, that's probably going to let you recover and train again. Uh, productively, you're going to be able to overload on tension and relative intensity and, and per session volume again in probably about half a week, right? So if you wait for an entire week, you know, are you losing muscle? No, you're still gaining it, but you're probably treading water for a long time, right? 
So if you do a really good high quality session that checks all the boxes except for frequency, right? It's uh, overloading on tension, it's overloading on relative intensity, it's overloading on volume. It's going to take you usually at most half a week, maybe a little longer to recover from it so that you can do another productive session. And if you choose to and you make it two sessions a week, you're going to grow a lot more muscle. And if you choose not to, yeah, you still grow a net amount of muscle from one session a week, but it's not that much. Not it's, it's decent and you can grow long term with it, but you can grow faster if it's two sessions a week. Same idea happens if you add another session and maybe even split the volume up a little bit more, but it's not a huge increase. Most studies find that three sessions per week is better than two, but already not all. Four sessions per week is usually better than three, but by a very small amount. The difference between five, six, and seven sets per week is, or sorry, sessions per week is so small that most research can't detect it. And anything higher than, oh, eight sessions per week, unless you get really creative, is going to have so many sessions that are each above their minimum effective volume. Because if a session is not a, it's a, a, above minimum effective volume itself, why the hell are you doing it? Right? You're just doing a bunch of warm ups then. Much more than seven sessions per week, if you really try to cram them in, is going to cause such an accession in weekly volume, fatigue is going to skyrocket. And all of a sudden, you're not growing as much muscle as you can. Right. So the frequency overload range is right between, oh, very charitably, one and seven sessions per week. But seven sessions per week is a whole lot, and it's really super unsustainable. And one is so far from optimal in most cases that we treat a working overload range as something like two to six sessions per week per muscle group. And that's going to depend on the muscle group. Not all muscle groups are able to tolerate that. So summing all of that up, the overload threshold for hypertrophy writ large, the overload threshold means that if you're going to get anywhere near your best growth, your training should meet the following rough four criteria. There's plenty of room for nuance, but not infinite nuance, right? At least 30% 1RM or heavier in most cases, and up to about 85% 1RM for a short period of time that can be heavier than 85% 1RM, but not indefinitely. For relative intensity, most of your training should be five reps away from failure or fewer, right, or closer to failure, and up to zero reps away from failure or just beyond it for a very short time that is a week or two in most cases, as long as you'll be able to sustain that and continue to overload. Number three is that per session, you should have probably at least two to four sets in non-beginners. Beginners can do one set per session and grow, but beginners usually don't watch these sorts of videos, uh, and you know, nor do they have problems growing, right? It's intermediates and advanced that sort of get problems growing that look into the depth of literature to solve those problems. Two to four sets per session. So if you're doing fewer than that, maybe not doing enough. And up to 10 plus sets per session for a short time. Then again, if you have a reasonable frequency, 10 plus working sets per session per muscle group is going to overreach you pretty fast. Okay. They mean a reasonable frequency is let's say an average of three sessions per week. If you do 10 plus sets for, uh, that are working sets, that's a weekly volume of 30 plus working sets. Uh, people can sustain that. Beginners can sustain that for several months. Intermediate advanced people for several weeks to a week at most. And, and that's just in the smaller muscles, forearms, biceps, side belts. Try that with your quads. And if you're a relatively strong person, you might find yourself lying in a gutter somewhere, right? So very unsustainable at the very high ends. And lastly, you should do at least one session per week to be guaranteed growth. You could know, train a muscle every two weeks is probably not a great idea. Um, but best results are probably somewhere between two and six sessions per week, and possibly even more than that for a very short period of time. All right. Huge chunk of this presentation out of the way, but we have another really serious methodological concept. <coughs> the overload threshold, remember there's the maximum ability of the system, minimum ability or zero, and the overload thresholds here somewhere, and anything between these two numbers is good because it causes growth. This bottom part probably rises, okay? It's not the same. A couple related problems. First, if you say, okay, there's this bottom range, right? I don't want to train here because the bottom seems to rise. We'll cover that in a sec. I'm going to train at the top all the time. I'm going to, what does the top mean? Actually, we'll just go back a slide. 85 plus percent on a RAM every session. Okay. It's sort of insane already. To failure and beyond every session. Already nobody trains like this. 
um, 10 plus sets in every session, you would be dead. And seven sessions per week. Do not try this at home. Do not try this anywhere, even in a hotel room. Okay. So not a good idea. So this is a real, real understatement. The top end range, the top end ranges are not sustainable for long periods of time. Certainly not a combination and even by themselves are not sustainable for long periods of time. So we cannot simply say, okay, well, who cares if the overload range moves? If we're just at the top all the time, we always win. Absolutely not. You can be at the top of it maybe once a month, once every two, not repeatable. However, here's the problem. Here's what we're trying to get away from number two. The bottom end of some of the ranges moves up over time. Okay. How many sets it used to take you to grow? It used to be here. Now it's here. It moves slowly, but it does move. So we have to have some adjustment. And here's another one. Because the entire range moves up and down over time, especially up, right? If we expose ourselves to any one thing in the middle of the range, any one stimulus will produce very good results the first time it is tried, but your body gets used to stuff and the range moves, the second time you have a stimulus, you probably, if it's the identical stimulus, you probably won't get as much out of it. The third time, you'll get a little less. The fourth time, a little less. The fifth time, a little less. After a while, you're getting nothing at all. Listen to analogous to every single experience you have with just a little bit of nuance there that some potentiating factors could make the second time or the third time even better than the first. But watch this. The first time you read that book on Eastern literature, how much do you learn? A ton. How much do you learn the second time? A lot, but uh, not as much. Right? It's certainly like some of the stuff you read, you're like, ah, knew that, knew that, knew that. That's not new because everything is new the first time. What about the third time? You could really like just solidifying concepts in its review. The fourth time, gee, you know, you just went on a plane trip somewhere for eight hours and you forgot all your other books and Wi-Fi doesn't work. You got this Eastern literature book again. You're like, oh, here we go. Time number four. And it couldn't even be hard to pay attention at that point. There could be some staleness that develops because you're getting almost nothing out of it, right? So these are all problems. We're going to look at them separately, but where we're going with this is Yes, there's an overall threshold. And prior to this, we were basically doing training like we're throwing darts into that threshold. As long as they hit in it, we're good. But it turns out because the threshold moves, and if we repeat the same kind of training over and over again, it's not optimal, the overload principle actually has a two-component definition. Things have to be in the overall threshold and over time have to go up. There has to be progression, which is why there's a term called progressive overload, precisely because of these three problems. So first problem, sustainability. You can train at 85% 1RM plus, but you can't do that for multiple sessions with hypertrophy, with hypertrophy volumes. You can do it with powerlifting volume, strength training, you can't do it with hypertrophy volumes. If you get into zero RIR or negative RIR, you can't maintain this at normal volumes for a very lengthy amount of time. Absolutely not, not sustainable. 10 to 15 sets per session, you can do every now and again if you work up to it, but you can't do it all the time because you're just going to fall apart into pieces unless you screw yourself on some of these other values. If you go... Gee, you know, if you go 10 reps shy of failure, you can certainly do 10 to 15 cents per session, but that's such a giant waste of your time. Very, very inefficient. And of course, four or more sessions for very large muscle groups and even six or more sessions for smaller muscle groups is usually not sustainable for an infinite amount of time. A lot of times because connective tissue doesn't heal as fast as muscular tissue, you get into situations where like your quads might heal in time for your next leg day, but after weeks and weeks and weeks of five time a week quad training, your knees might not enjoy the process. It's pretty well documented in the actual athlete population. So the implication here is that when you start a hypertrophy training program, it's probably not a good idea to start close to those upper ends. We've got this threshold. You don't want to start a hypertrophy training program here. Um, there's just nowhere to go and you sort of self-exhaust and you have to take a bunch of deloads and then you're resting a whole lot and not training a whole lot. It's probably not optimal for hypertrophy and probably not sustainable from an injury perspective, even if you do get some muscle growth out of it. So maybe you don't want to start all the way up here. Maybe you want to start somewhere in the middle uh, or closer to the bottom of the range. Let's talk about the bottom of the range. Let's say you start close to the bottom of the range. You just want to sit there for a while. Well, here's a problem. Over multiple days of training, your 30% 1RM goes up. Okay, so if you picked a weight that was 30% one of your M, a couple of days later, when you do the same lift, uh, you're going to be able to do more reps than you used to. That 30% one of your M is no longer 30% one of M. It might be your 28% one of M. And it might be okay to stimulate close to optimal growth, but after a few weeks, it's certainly not okay because it's close to 20% of your one of M. And now you may be getting very, very suboptimal growth. So if anything, that 30% one of M range, you have to train heavier and heavier to stay north of it. Okay. In addition to that, we have the rest reps and reserve problem. As you do the same weight, if you continue to do that same weight for the same reps, 
your reps in reserve actually starts to rise, right? You do a set of 10 with 300 pounds on the squat week one. Week two, you do a set of, and let's say that's uh, three reps shy of failure. Okay, tough. Next week, you do 300 pounds for a set of 10 in the squat. That might be like, you know, you're better at squatting now. There's neurological adaptations. You've grown some muscle. You have accumulated some fitness. And now you're at four reps in reserve with 300 pounds for 10. That's still hypertrophic, but less so. Fast forward that a couple of weeks and 300 pounds for a set of 10 is now at six, eight reps in reserve. It's not even close to optimally hypertrophic. That's a really big problem. So we have to put either more weight on the bar or we have to do more reps if we're going to stay in our close to failure range. Training has to be more challenging over time simply because we have to continue to be at least in the reps and reserve range. Anything really far away from failure is not a super good idea. Next issue, on the volume front, over weeks of training, your muscles desensitize to any given training volume and they get less and less growth out of any given volume, especially if you start at your minimum effective volume. After multiple weeks, you might actually be, if you don't change your volume at all, below your minimum effective volume. You started out with a routine that caused you growth in the first couple of weeks, but after a couple of weeks, you're so used to the volume that that might actually just be a maintenance program at that point. You grew some muscle early in the program, but later in the program, muscle growth uh, has really started to stall out. And especially for beginners, okay, uh, because they adapt super quick, but everyone does this to some extent, um, any given frequency becomes less effective over the months because as you're able to tolerate more and more volume, you tend to heal faster between sessions and you could have just squeezed in another session. For example, if you do two sessions per week of quads and uh, you, you do this for several months, you're going to get really great gains. But after a while, you're going to notice that in the volume ranges that you're normally doing, gee, you know, you figure, okay, I train quads Monday and I train with Thursday. I'm like, Wednesdays and Sundays, I'm like not sore at all. I could totally hit another quad workout. I gotta wait a whole day. You figure, you know, why don't I try quads Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? You try it and there's no problem squeezing it all in. And all of a sudden you're up to three ses sessions and you can actually recover. You think, okay, I can't do this forever because my joints are going to start to hurt. But gee, for at least a couple months, I'm going to be able to do three sets per session. Could you have still gotten gains with two sets per, or two, uh, sorry, two sessions per week? Yes. Would they have been optimal? Probably not, right? As you get more experience in training, over months of training in any particular style, particular exercises especially, you can add sessions per week slowly. Every mesocycle or two, you can add a session per week because your body gets used to training and can handle its recovery ability goes up so much that you can probably do more sessions and get much more benefit. Remember, if you do a really high number of sessions, it's a self-extinguishing process. You can't keep raising them. At some point, you have to lower them back down for everything to recover. But in the short term, you can raise them and then re-lower, raise and re-lower, and so on and so forth. Lastly, point number three, this problem here with that leads to the idea of progressive overload. At any given load and reps used, even if you're not at the bottom of this range, reps and reserve starts to rise strength rises, work capacity rises. So either load or reps have to increase for best gains, right? Even if you start at a challenging volume, you start at five sets per session instead of two, right? If you start with a certain weight on the bar and certain numbers of reps, one or two of those have to go up, right? And of course, over the course of multiple weeks of training, muscle growth in terms of number of sets per session also begins to desensitize. This happens slowly, but it does happen. So that if you start with something not at your minimum effective volume, let's say you start at six sets per session, you get a certain amount of growth out of those sets in the first session, a certain amount of growth in the second and third, fourth, so on and so forth. By, you know, your 10th session of the mesocycle, maybe four weeks in or something, you're not getting nearly as much growth out of six sets per session as you were. And somebody could ask, well, how do we, re how do we mediate that? How do we remediate that? Well, you know, you can increase intensity, relative intensity only so much. Unfortunately, if you go really close to failure, yeah, you're causing more growth, but you're causing way more fatigue. You won't be able to keep that up. We might ask the question of like, so why don't we like uh, every two weeks or something, as we notice that it's just not enough, like we don't get super, super big pumps anymore, we hardly get sore, we feel like we're under training, maybe we should add a set here and there. And instead of staying at six, we could go to seven, and then we could go to eight, and we go to nine, and maybe we can go to 10, and then it's too much, it's too much fatigue, and then we deload. Well, that sounds like a good idea. Because anytime you do six sets per session once or twice or three times, after probably three 
the sessions of six sets per session, seven is better. Eight would be better. So you have to ask yourself the question of why am I continuing to do six sets per session, even though it was a really awesome when I started, if I could do better if I moved up. In almost all of the literature in volume and hypertrophy training as far as number of sets shows that up until a very high point, probably around 10 sets per session, doing more sets per session causes more muscle growth. So even if you start at a reasonable, even if you don't start all the way down at MEV, I mean, if you start at MEV, it's clearly you have to add more sets because there's huge upsides to doing. If you start at two sets per session, there's a big upside to doing three and a really big upside to doing four, so on and so forth. Even if you start at something reasonable like six, at some point, you know, six could coast you out for a couple of weeks of good gains. But the best gains probably mean you have to add at least one or two sets over the course of a mesocycle in order to keep the best gains up, right? And of course, um, you can only add so much volume per session until it starts to interfere with its own design. So if you add more than 10 or 15 sets per session, then you get so much damage that it no longer makes any sense. But you can say to yourself, yeah, like per session, I can't do this, but I'm recovering so fast between sessions now, it might make sense to add a session in the week. So you can start a mesocycle with um, two sets per session and just by adding reps or weight and sets, you can get optimal hypertrophy at two sessions per week or pretty close. Next mesocycle though, gee, you may, you may be ready for three sessions a week. Again, starting at the very low end and working your way back up as far as sets per session are concerned. So you start at four sets per session and work your way back up. But now because you're starting at three sets or sorry, three sessions per week, you get more growth. And then the next mesocycle, you might be able to do four sessions per week. The meso after that, could you do five? Maybe, but your cumulative fatigue might be so high. You need uh, time for active rest you know, two weeks to really calm the body down. And then your body's so sort of resensitized to hypertrophy and the work capacity and recoverability are so low because of two weeks of easy stuff that you may be back down to benefiting maximally from two to three sessions per week and, and not having to go to five, six, seven, and so on and so forth. So that takes us into our programming recommendations. When starting a block, which is multiple mesocycles, oh, right around three mesocycles of training, you want to train very likely in multiple zones of the 30 to 85% range, which is to say some literature has shown that if you train in the lower end, middle range, and high, higher end of that range, that you get optimal hypertrophy, maybe something to do with stimulating every kind of muscle fiber there is. So train in multiple zones of that range, but make sure to increase weights approximately weekly, right, to keep the zones moving up with strength gains. You don't want your 15 rep zone to turn into your 25 rep zone because then you're ignoring the 15 rep zone, right? Generally speaking, there's sort of three zones, the five to 10 rep, the 10 to 20, and the 20 to 30. You want to make sure that for the exercises you've chosen to be in each one of those zones in the week, that they're still in the zones. You know, you don't want your strength to improve so much that we used to do for sets of 12, you now do for sets of 22 because that literally just bumped into another zone. So it's a good idea to increase um, weights on the bar and uh, if you can increase weights for whatever reason, you can increase reps, but the rep increases have to be in that range uh, that they started out in. Number two, you start at roughly three to five reps in reserve at the beginning of a mesocycle, and cumulative fatigue is going to bring you down to around zero reps in reserve before you end each mesos if you just try to match the last week's reps. So how does this work? You start at three to five RIR and you do like 100 pounds for sets of uh, average of 10. Then you do one of five pounds, then you do one of you know, 110, 115, 120, and as you keep going up in weight, it gets harder and harder to do the same number of reps. But also your fitness is improving, so maybe it doesn't get much harder. However, your cumulative fatigue that entire time is going to start to rise, which means at some point, you're going to have to go all the way to failure to match the reps that you've started to do. By definition, you can't really do better than that next week because next week the fatigue's even higher. You're going to start underperforming. You're then by definition under-recovered and you're probably doing more harm than good if you keep going for longer. Good time to deload, right? On the volume side, <coughs> on the volume side, you want to start closer to your MEV. I'm not going to say it's definitive that you have to start right at your minimum effective volume. There are some good arguments for it. There's some good arguments against having to start right that low. Closer to your MEV, maybe two to four sets per session per muscle group, sometimes on the high end, sometimes on the low end. Work up to your maximum recoverable volume and then deload right after, which is usually going to end up at eight to 12 sets or so for the average muscle group. And you work up not like, okay, I have to add a set every week. You work up based on feedback. For example, what kind of pumps are you getting? 
Okay, if you're getting really good pumps, you're in, you're good. There's probably enough volume. If you're getting barely any pumps and used to get good pumps, you're probably used to it. It's probably time for more. Soreness. If you're not getting sore at all, you might be having optimal hypertrophy, but you might not be. If your performance is still good, try adding a set. You might grow more. On the other hand, if you're getting wildly sore and you're not even healing on time, adding sets is a really, really bad idea because you're clearly under recovering. And of course, effort perception. If you go in there and do four sets of curls and you're like, that was the easiest thing I've ever done in my life, it's just unlikely that that's optimal growth, okay, in almost every case. So next week, maybe do five sets of curls. I'm like, okay, that beat me up quite a bit more. I feel like I did something. Probably pretty well related to hypertrophy. So auto-regulate your way up in volume. I'm not even going to say up. Auto-regulate your volume, and it's usually going to go up if you start sufficiently low to give yourself some expansion room, some progression room. Lastly, number four, on the frequency front, start the meso at the low end of effective frequency. So maybe like something like two to three sessions per week for the average muscle, and then increase frequency, perhaps every meso, usually just jump one frequency. I would almost never go from two sessions of biceps per week to doing four sessions of biceps per week. I would almost always just jump by one, jump by one, jump by one. And then until the last mesocycle of a block, let's say if three mesocycles is only sustainable for that mesocycle and you could never repeat it, you need to back off after. For example, three sets of, or sorry, three sessions of chest in the first mesocycle, four sessions of chest in the second, and the last third mesocycle, five sessions of chest, which beats you up so much that there's no way you can do five sessions of chest in another mesocycle. You just need a break, you need an active rest, you need a resensitization phase, you need something. So that's the way that works. And on a technical note, it is absolutely the case to say that your adaptations really kind of drive overload. Remember, it's because you're getting stronger that you need progression, right? So it's absolutely true to say when people say, well, it's the fact that you're getting better that drives overload and not the other way around, but it also works the other way around. So you have to drive overload sometimes, even if you feel like crap, right? First benefit is functional overreach. You may already be close to overreached, and if you just listened to yourself, you would do the same weights and sets and reps or even less. But if you push yourself mentally just a bit further, you could get a big dip in performance and ability. And if you take a break like a deal it after, you get a huge rise and you get functional overreach, which is really, really awesome. In addition to that, sometimes matching big PRs requires a lot of motivation. So you could come into the gym and you can you did squatted last time you squatted 390 for an average of you know eight reps per set. And you can say, yeah, you know, I I know that. As I'm getting stronger, overload will reveal itself. I don't feel that great today. Do you ever really feel great enough to squat 390 though? It's a lot of weight. It feels terrible on your back. You might have to will yourself and go 395 for sets of eight or nine. All of a sudden you hit this huge PR and you think, gee, you know, I really planned that overload. Now, if you try to hit it and it doesn't work and you get much weaker, clearly you haven't got strong enough to sort of earn that overload and you have to deload back up and everything else. But when we say that adaptations drive overload and say that overload doesn't drive adaptations, it's both. It's overloading training makes you better and it also makes you stronger to deserve more overloading training, to need it. But on some occasions, pretty often, especially towards the end of a mesocycle, you have to use overload to drive adaptations because otherwise you're going to be too tired or too lazy or just too mentally weak to keep going where there is a benefit to do that every now and again. Right, which is to say, auto regulation and feedback have their place, but that means they have their place. It's not at the top of the food chain. It's in balance with knowing what you have to do, and sometimes you can push yourself in short term and benefit to a really, really high extent. All right. Finally, summary and implications. What do we get from all this? First big hit is that you don't have to hit all time PRs in every single session for overload to be met and for muscle growth to occur. Right. I'll post something on Instagram, like I did this lift here and then I did this other lift a week later. And they say like, well, you didn't use more weight on this. Doesn't that violate the overload principle? Absolutely doesn't violate the overload principle at all. Now, if I was doing that for eight months straight and I never got stronger, that would probably start to over violate the overload principle because it would dip below the threshold or it just violating it in the optimality perspective where I'm not doing this to get through the range. I'm kind of just whittling around the middle and slowly declining, right? So yes, you don't have to PR all the time. However, you have to at least maintain minimum threshold values for tension, relative intensity, volume, and frequency to cause growth. 
So people say like, oh, you know, overload's just a range. It's not a specific number. Totally. But that range is a pretty constrained range and you can train easier than that range and you probably won't get your best growth or actually any growth. And that advice to be in the range, that's just to cause some growth. For best growth, which is I suspect what you might be after, you probably want to keep increasing weights to stay in those, so three tension ranges, right? You want some weights to be in the 30 to 50%, 50 to 70 and 70 to 85% range corresponding to the five to 10, 10 to 20 and 20 to 30 rep ranges. And you probably want to increase them so they at least stay in those rep ranges. You probably want to start at roughly three or five uh, reps in reserve and let the IRS fall as you match reps and increase weights. You probably want to start around your MEV and go all the way up to your MRV. You're probably leaving something in the tank. And it's probably a good idea to start at the lower end of frequencies and mesocycles and work your way back up. You don't have to turn all these dials at once. Some of us can't. Some of us can't add frequency. Like we only go to the gym four times a week. That's as far as we're ever going to get. We literally can't modulate frequency at all. That's okay. At least modulate all the other stuff. You might not even be able to modulate volume. At least modulate intensity and relative intensity, right? Do everything you can. You don't have to turn the dials up all at the same time but you should at least be turning some of them often enough to keep the body not only in that threshold range, but moving through it probably from its lower end to its upper end, deloading in and repeating and repeating and repeating so you get the best possible results of progressive overload. Ugh. Folks, thanks so much for tuning in. Next time, we are going to be talking about ooh, range of motion what qualifies as good range of motion, what qualifies as not good range of motion, everything in between. We'll get super technical. See you then.